as I f- mentioned a, a few weeks ago, a great theme of this letter is the betterness of Christ. I'm not sure if actually betterness is a word, but I'm going to use that word. I'm going to coin it if it's not a word. Betterness, the betterness of Christ. Um, there's a Greek word that's used throughout this letter, uh, kreton, which means better, right? It occurs 12 times. There's 13 chapters in this book. Each chapter it occurs once in. And in the first chapter of this letter, the author pointed out that Christ is better than the patriarchs and the prophets. Now, this would have been pretty shocking for many Jews who the author of this book was writing to, believing Jews uh, of his day. This would have been somewhat shocking for for many of them to hear um, because the the patriarchs and the prophets were very highly revered. Um, Moses, not really a patriarch, but a prophet, he was very highly revered. The man through whom God gave Israel the law. To an Israelite, Moses really stands as the supreme pioneer of the nation. To the Jewish Christian, then, respect for Moses it continues, but as verse 3 says, Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. Now, while Moses was the pioneer of the nation, as chapter 2 said to us, Jesus is the pioneer of our salvation. Moses couldn't take Israel into the promised land. Only Joshua or Yeshua, Jesus, could. A great illustration of the betterness of Christ is what happened on the Mount of Transfiguration, which, you know, by the way, if you went to Israel, there you're not going to go visit Mount of Transfiguration. It actually happened. It took place on Mount Hermon. But it's recorded in Matthew chapter 17. It's recorded in Mark 9 as well as Luke chapter 9. Peter also referenced it in 2 Peter 1. Jesus took a few of his disciples with him, Peter, James, and John. And as they observed, Jesus was transfigured before them. The Shekinah glory of the Lord, which was incarnate in Christ, shone through. And Moses and Elijah appeared, and they were in conversation with Jesus. Peter interrupted, and he suggested that they should build three tabernacles, one for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for Jesus. In other words, Peter thought, you know what? All these are equal. We have uh, Moses representing the law. We have Elijah representing the prophets. And we have Jesus, the gospel, our Savior. And he insinuated by this that they were all equal. But the reality was that Jesus is better. And so the father spoke out and he said, listen to my son. And suddenly the only one standing before them was Jesus. This is important. If you go back in Scripture, if you dig into the Torah and the Navi'im or the prophets, the law and the prophets, you will find that it all speaks of Christ. And that was the point of the law. It was our tutor or schoolmaster or guardian to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law is good in that the, through the law we become aware of our sin. But nobody will be declared righteous in God's sight by the working of the law. Why can't we be declared righteous by the working of the law? Well, Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous, not one. And Romans 3.23 says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Paul wrote that the law was made weak through the flesh, which was incapable of keeping the law perfectly. 
But what the law could not do, God did. He sent His own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, He condemned sin in the flesh. And so, as Romans 8, 1 says, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. God had introduced a system of sacrifices of animals. That could offer a temporary covering for man's sins. But those sacrifices had to be made day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Jesus, however, fulfills all the requirements for a sacrifice. And because he ever lives to intercede on our behalf, his sacrifice is once for all who will receive him. So then Jesus offers a better revelation. He offers a better position. He offers a better priesthood. He offers a better covenant. He offers a better sacrifice. And he offers a better power. Jesus is better than the patriarchs. He's better than the prophets. He is the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. He is better. The author spent the better portion of the chapter explaining that Christ is better than angels. And he did this because people came to think of the angels as being intermediaries between God and human beings. They came to believe that God spoke to them through the angels, and the angels carried their prayers then into the presence of God. This is an idea that needed to be overcome because 1 Timothy 2.5 tells us there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. And so in chapter 1, he asked a series of rhetorical questions and provided the answers using Scripture. Generally, it was along the lines of, to which angel did God ever say, but, the son, but to the Son, he says. And he finally gets to the point that the angels are ministering spirits and they minister to those who will inherit salvation. Now, in chapter 2, the author continued in his presentation of this betterness of Christ by focusing on Christ over the angels. But let's not overlook that the author made it clear that Christ's work was not for the angels. His work was for man. Hebrews 2.16, For indeed he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. The author was writing primarily to Messianic or Christian Jews who were drifting away from the truth of the gospel. As is the case for most of us, old habits retain a pull. Can you imagine how hard it was for Jewish believers in that day not to participate in the sacrifices when all your family and all your friends were? And how hard it would be then not to drift back to the law when you're under the threat of persecution by those who were holding to the law. But as we'll soon see, the author of Hebrews calls out and he confronts this behavior, calling it drifting and referring to it as backsliding. Now, chapter 2 closed out with some really deep theological truth. That truth is this. Jesus did not come to save angels. He came to save people. This meant that he had to take on flesh and blood and become a man. Only then could he die and through his death defeat Satan. Satan is the author of sin, and sin brings death. Satan uses the fear of death as a terrible weapon to gain control over the lives of people. We who trust in Jesus Christ have once and for all been delivered from Satan's authority and from that terrible fear of death. And because Jesus became like us and endured temptation as we do, yet without sin, he is able to be a merciful and faithful high priest. Now we move into the third argument for the superiority of Christ. And that argument is Christ is better than Moses. Of course, Moses was the great hero of the Jewish nation. In today's chapter, the author is going to take on this Jewish reverence of Moses. And while Moses was not a patriarch, he was revered as great because it was through him that God gave the law to Israel. 
if the author was to prove that Christ is better than Moses, it would be the equivalent of proving the, support, the superiority of uh, faith in Christ over uh, continuing in the law. And if, uh, in regards to, to backsliding believers, you know, how could anyone go back to, to the old system when what Christ offers is so much greater than what Moses offers? So that's where we are this morning. Let's, let's pray, and then we'll, we'll get into Scripture. Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, as we uh, embark on this study of your word this morning, we ask that our hearts would be open to receive all that you have to say to us. We desire to be hearers. We desire to be doers of your word. We want you to lead us in your ways. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so Hebrews chapter 3. Starting with verse 1. It says, Therefore, holy brethren, partakers of the heavenly calling, consider the apostle and high priest of our confession, Christ Jesus, who was faithful to him who appointed him, as Moses also was faithful in all his house. In verse 1, Holy is aios, meaning holy as in belonging to God. Brethren is adelphos, meaning brothers and sisters, as in a, a closely associated group of people. Apostle, uh, apostolos, meaning a special messenger. And high priest is ahieres, meaning most important priest. The first two of those, holy and apostle. Not holy and brethren. <laughs> I'm out of order. They describe those who would be reading this letter. Then the latter two, uh, apostle and high priest, they're describing our Lord Jesus Christ. So then, you know, from the first two, we know that the intended audience of this letter were believers. That is, those who have been saved by the gospel. Now, believers are brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are counted as holy unto the Lord. The second is not something that any unbelieving Jewish man or woman could claim, because it insinuates belonging to what we call the church. The intent of the word is it's not only clear from how it's used here, it's also used in Acts and the writings of, of Paul as well as in, in James in reference to the church. And this association with the church is made even clearer by that phrase, partakers of the heavenly calling. And that word partakers is the same word that's translated partners later uh, earlier in Luke chapter 2. Actually, I think it's Luke 5. I think I got it wrong in my notes. Luke chapter 5. I think it's Luke 5 verse 7, if I remember correctly. There it describes the relationship of four men who were, well, they were in the fishing business <laughs> together. You know, there are quite a few things that, that Christians share in. We share in our confession of Jesus Christ, and we share in our heavenly calling. According to Ephesians 5, we are members of his body. Verse 4 of chapter 6 tells us that we are together partakers of the Holy Spirit. Every believer has the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 1, 13-14 teaches us that the Holy Spirit is the seal of salvation for all those who believe. It says, In him you also trusted after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. Romans 8 tells us that only believers have the Holy Spirit says, but you are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if indeed the spirit of God dwells in you. Now, if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he is not his. 
If you have received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have received the Holy Spirit. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You are sealed unto salvation by the Holy Spirit. Hebrews 12 reminds us that we also share in another benefit, and that is God's chastening. It's a benefit because his chastening is evidence that we are his and that he loves us. And there are many other things that the Bible says we share in as believers. But, you know, let's go back to one that we noted earlier from the first couple of verses here, and that is our mutual confession of faith in Jesus Christ. The word is homologia and simply means to say the same thing. When it comes to salvation, Christians are supposed to say the same thing. In chapter 4, Hebrews says, let us hold fast our confession. In chapter 10, it says, let us hold fast the confession. This is the confession of faith in what Christ has done for us that we hold on to regardless of our circumstances. You know, it was not Moses who did all of this for the people who were addressed in this epistle, nor was it the patriarchs or the prophets or the angels. It was Jesus Christ. And verse 1 is really an exhortation. It's not an exhortation to consider Moses, but it's an exhortation to consider Christ. In fact, we have that word considered there in the verse. The word consider in verse 1 is uh, katonoeo and means to consider carefully to understand fully. Now, to do that, we need to carefully consider who Christ is and what Christ has done. And to that end, the author sets up a comparison between Moses and Christ. Moses was merely a man. He was called to be a prophet and leader. On the other hand, Jesus Christ is the Son of God sent by the Father into the world. And while Moses was certainly called and commissioned by God as a special messenger, Jesus Christ was sent as God's last word to sinful man. From the time of Adam forward to the close of the prophet Malachi's ministry, this was an an initial period of God's revelation. And it was a time in which God pointed man toward the work that his son would accomplish on our behalf. God was preparing the way for his final word. In giving his holy law through Moses, God exposed man's sin and our need for a Savior. The types and the offices and all the the ceremonies and even the the people of the Old Testament illustrated concepts that, that bore witness to the future work of Christ. These things produced a a text that made it possible for us to understand the person and the work of Christ. The author of Hebrews opened up this letter, saying, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. God's final word came to us through Jesus Christ. Christ is the fulfillment of all the Old Covenant types. He is the subject of the prophets. He is the object of Israel's forward-looking faith. So great was the revelation that was made through the Son that He is called the Word. Moses was a prophet who on occasion served as a priest, but he was never a high priest. That title actually belonged to his brother Aaron. In fact, Jesus Christ ultimately has that title, great high priest, as all high priests who came before him, they were in perfect shadows of his perfect high priesthood. As the apostle, Jesus Christ represented God to men. This is the only place in the New Testament where Jesus is called an apostle. It speaks of his role as one who was sent to proclaim salvation. As the high priest, he now represents men to God in heaven. Moses, of course, fulfilled similar ministries. He he taught Israel God's truth, and he interceded with the Lord on behalf of Israel at various times. But Moses' ministry was one of preparation preparation 
while Christ's ministry was one of fulfillment. Moses was primarily the prophet of law. Jesus Christ is the bringer of God's grace. John 1.17 says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth come through or came through Jesus Christ. Now in verse 2, the writer notes that Moses and Jesus Christ were both faithful in the work God gave them to do. Moses was not sinless, as was Jesus. But he was faithful, and he obeyed God's will. And when Moses' sister and brother, Miriam and Aaron, spoke against Moses, the Lord intervened. He said, he is faithful in all my house. These arguments that the writer is presenting were meant to be an encouragement to those first century Jewish believers to remain faithful to Christ. They were enduring trials and they were being tempted to drift away by returning to the law or, or to try to blend together the two uh, in order to kind of fly under the radar, so to speak. And instead of going back to Moses, they should imitate Moses and be faithful to their calling. Verse 3. For this one has been counted worthy of, much, of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. For every house is built by someone, but he who built all things is God. And Moses, indeed, was faithful in all his house as a servant for a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Christ, as a son over his own house, whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm to the end. There's a certain word that's repeated a lot in those verses. Anybody notice which one it was? House. It's actually six times there in those verses. It's the Greek word eukos, and it means house or home. And the author, What the author is doing here is he's developing a theme by playing off his earlier reference to Moses being faithful in all, uh, it says, quote, in all his house in verse 2. But first I want you to notice something from verse 2. I know we're past verse 2, but look back to verse 2 there. Whose house is it? Look at the pronoun. It's his house. His, not Moses's. His refers to Christ. It's Christ's house. Moses was faithful in all God's house, the house that Christ built. But there's even more to it here. Now, chapter 1 had told us that it was through Christ that God made the worlds. But house here is not referring to uh, the earth or the universe even. Verse 6 says whose house we are. His house refers to the people of God, not a material building or to the earth or to the universe. You know, Moses ministered to Israel, the people of God under the old covenant. Today, Christ ministers to his church, the people of God under the new covenant. And when it says whose house we are, we should keep in mind who this letter was written to. And that is believing Jews. Now, a great illustration of this dual use of house is found in 2 Samuel chapter 7. David wanted to build a temple for God, a house which, in which God could dwell. But God told David that he would build David's house, meaning his household or his family, his uh, genealogy down the line, and make a covenant with David's descendants. So we have the house of Israel under the old covenant. And then we have the household of faith under the new covenant. Both were in operation at all times. Israel is God's special people. But in Israel, there were those who had faith, and then there were those who did not. So there was a house within a house, so to speak. 
Now remember that salvation has never been through obedience to the law because the law was made weak through our flesh, but salvation has always been by grace through faith. Prior to the first incarnation of Christ, it was faith in the Lord. And after, it is faith in the Lord. In both instances, dependent on the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So then Moses was faithful in all of the Lord's house. And this draws out the contrast between Moses and Christ. Moses was a servant in the house. Jesus Christ is a son over the house. Moses was a member of the household, but Jesus built the house. But the end of verse 5 and verse 6 demonstrate another part of Christ's superiority over Moses. and That is that Moses spoke about things to come, a testimony of those things which would be spoken afterward. But Jesus Christ brought the fulfillment of those things as indicated with verse 6. Now later we'll see how Hebrews 8 speaks of Moses serving the pattern and shadow while Jesus Christ brought the full and final light of the gospel of the the grace of God. Look at verse 5. The Greek word translated servant is not the usual New Testament word for servant or slave. In fact, in the New Testament, it's only used speaking of Moses. It's the word therapon. And it speaks of someone who renders service voluntarily out of affection. Now remember that at the beginning of his ministry, Moses was a bit hesitant and he resisted God's will. I'm the wrong person for this. I can't speak well. Um, He had a lot of excuses. We've all had a lot of excuses, I'm sure. But once he surrendered, he obeyed out of a heart of love and devotion. Now, we need to spend a little bit of time on this if clause that closes out verse 6. If we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of hope firm to the end. This should be understood in light of the context of the story of Moses. That is, Moses leading Israel out of Egypt and to the promised land. The writer is not suggesting that we as Christians must continuously work to keep ourselves saved. If that were the case, it would would be a huge problem in this letter because it would would contradict the major theme of this letter, which is the completed work of Christ and, and his heavenly ministry that guarantees our eternal salvation. This statement really should be understood as an affirmation that those who hold fast their confidence and hope are proving that they are born again. Now, I know you all probably get tired of of, just me reciting Greek words to you, but I'm going to do it one more time. In verse 6, the word confidence is parousia, and it literally means freedom of speech and openness. When we are free to speak, we can speak plainly with openness. We see the same word Later in chapter 4 and verse 16, where it says, Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And there it's translated boldness. But it's the same word. And it gives the idea of being able to come before the throne to confess without fear of condemnation. We might confess sin. Failings, fear, doubts, whatever it is. If you belong to Christ, you have an audience with Him without worry of condemnation. Hebrews 10 reveals how we have this boldness because of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, having boldness to enter the holiest by the blood of Jesus is what it says in verse 19 of chapter 10. Because he shed his blood for us, we may have the gravest sin to confess. Yet we need not fear to bring it before him. We can have confidence in Jesus Christ who never fails. And look at the last few words of verse 6. Rejoicing and hope that is firm to the end. 
because of this confidence in Christ, in this confession of Christ, we can rejoice now in our eternal hope. Yes, there are trials that we all are experiencing in this life, especially as believers. And yet, because of the goodness of our Lord, we can enjoy spiritual endurance. Jesus Christ rules over his house, and he will care for each member of the family. He is the faithful high priest who provides all the grace that we need for every demand of life. In chapter 13, Jesus is referred to as the great shepherd of the sheep. And it continues with the idea that the sheep are being made complete in every good work to do his will. He is working in his sheep to do what is well-pleasing in his sight. Now, this doesn't mean that God has given you some specific grand duty to fulfill that is your destiny, and if you don't, then you have failed him. You know, that's a, that's a very popular idea that's being uh, taught around in the church today, that you have this great destiny that God has created you for, and if you are simply uh, just going to work and support your family and, and be a good friend, then you're letting God down. Instead, you need to, to press in and take hold of that great calling, that great, incredible destiny, that amazing thing that you're going to do. And God's Word by no means teaches that. Instead, people, people teach that out of their own ideas. Ephesians 2.10 does not speak of some uh, singular great grand work that you're destined to do. It says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It's works, plural. And in Hebrews 13, it's every good work. And in James 2.17, it's plural. The Greek word in all these instances speaks of deeds done by people. Good works are not those things that only a select few people ever achieve. Good works are those things that are pleasing to God. Good works, according to Scripture, are things like in Luke 6.35, loving your enemies, and lending to others. In Psalm 37, 3, trusting in the Lord. In Hebrews 13, doing good and sharing. In other places, being a testimony uh, of the Lord to others. Taking care of your family. I mean, we could list out things for hours and hours because good works covers everything we do when we're doing them as unto the Lord. This means that your good works can include the way that you operate your motor vehicle in traffic. What you do at work. What you do in the classroom. What you do in your neighborhood or at church. If you're a boss, then part of your good works involves the way that you manage employees. If you're a parent, then your good works include making dinner for your children. You know, as a, as a pastor, I, I can finish up Sunday service and, and go off into my office and, and, and just completely feel like I have failed God because there were only a, a handful of people at church this morning. But that's me not understanding what God thinks of as a good work. I mean, did I work diligently to prepare the message? Did I teach God's written word faithfully to those who showed up? That, then, is a good work. You know, there used to be times when I, I would... I would 
give a sermon to empty chairs. That was still a good work. Now, I, I'm not... I am, but I'm not trying to point to myself. Just, I just want to give an example. You know, it's hard for me to give an example from, from y'all because, well, that would probably be embarrassing to you. I'd rather embarrass myself. You know, so forgive me for using myself there, but the point is that we somehow feel like what mankind or what many Christians consider success to look like, that that's what defines a good work. Ephesians 2 says that these good works are things that God prepared beforehand for us to walk in. So then, if we're being critical of good works, the good works that we have been given to do, friends, family, job, testimony of Christ to others, if, if we're saying those things are too small, then we're criticizing our Lord God who gave us those works to do. And those who, who get up before congregations and say that you have this incredible destiny and if you are not working to fulfill that destiny, then, then you are in sin, you're failing God. They're showing that, that they are more concerned. Maybe they're concerned about, about Christ's name being exalted, but they also have this, this prideful concern about where their name is in lights. Whose house we are, if we hold fast the confidence and rejoicing of the hope firm to the end, in verse 6, speaks of proven faith, proven not by you know, grand exploits, but proven by steadfastness, confidence, and joyful hope. We're not burdened by the past. We're not threatened by the present. And we can celebrate knowing what our future is. We're simply, day by day, living to please the Lord as we await the blessed hope of His return. It is a very good work to simply believe God and it pleases him greatly we're going to stop there for this morning stay simple my friends stay simple let's pray Lord we thank you for this time that we've had together worshiping you in song worshiping you by studying your word. And we thank you that, that you are faithful. We thank you that your mercy endures forever. Lord, we ask that you would increase our love for one another. Establish us in all good things. Keep our minds and our hands from evil. And, and Lord, we ask that you would protect us from the deceptions of our enemy. Thank you that you are our great high priest. Lord, we thank you for every good work that you have begun in us. And as your word says, that that great work, that good work that you've begun in us, that you will bring it to completion. Lord, we ask that you would lead us in works that glorify you. He must increase. I must decrease. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May He make His face and His light to shine upon you. May He lift up His countenance upon you and give you His peace, His shalom. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach, this Jesus, our Lord, 
and our Savior. And everyone said, Amen.